Now, uh, please silence your phone. <coughs> All right. I'd like to introduce Dietmar Offenhuber. Come on up. <coughs> Thank you. Yeah, thanks. I like to have, have this one. Does this work? Yeah, I think so. Uh, yeah, thanks, uh, Boston Kai, for inviting me. Thanks for Google for hosting, and thank you for coming after this snowstorm last week and this kind of all rearrangement, uh, registration, and all that stuff. Thanks uh, that you made it. So today I'm going to talk about a small pet project that I've been working on together with my colleague uh, Orkan Talhan from UPenn uh, on and off for the past 10 years. Um, I'm uh, heading at Northeastern uh, Information Design and Visualization Program, and of course it's always fun to you know, play with large data sets and explore uh, what, what they uh, contain. But I found myself more and more uh, drawn to questions of the material and social conditions how, under which data sets emerge. And uh, <clears throat> I'm gonna talk about today about visualization principles for material information. So uh, talk is divided into four parts. First, I'm going to talk a little bit about data visualization and its limits. Uh, I'm going to talk about what we mean by autographic visualization. Uh, and uh, I'm going to go more into design principles and, and rhetoric techniques uh, of autographic visualizations before I conclude with yeah, some of the limitations. So let's start <coughs> with the things that visualization cannot directly show. And I want to explain this through an example. So last year, state of Florida passed this legislation uh, that allows parents to object content of textbooks uh, used in science classes in school. Schools and the conservative Heartland Institute uh, from Illinois sent out uh, this publication to every public science teacher in Florida. And uh, yeah, uh, no spoiler, it's, it's uh, of course a, a climate change skeptic publication. It looks like a, a legitimate academic publication with lots of, lots of charts and references. And uh, I want to talk briefly about uh, this chart that uh, warns us that we are headed towards a new ice age. So uh, it's based on data derived from ice core samples in Greenland uh, using the isotope ratios as a proxy for, for temperature. Uh, the data is based on a legitimate source, a data set by uh, <coughs> um, yeah, a professor from uh, U, uh, no, it's, uh, yeah, Penn State University, uh, Richard Alley. And uh, yeah, everything is correctly labeled and, and annotated. Uh, there's just one small detail. If we look at this very, very last data point, uh, I don't know how to, maybe I can, is there a pointer? Oh yeah, this very last data point here. Uh, this actually represents the year 1855. And that's not, you know, that of course, takes out uh, some of uh, you know some of this drama uh, of, of, of the evi of makes the evidence a little bit less compelling um, and that's that's related to uh, some of the conventions in uh, paleoclimatology and the author David Lappi uh, actually painted it red uh, to, as a as an obvious reference that this kind of minuscule uh, amount of warming uh, to contrast it with the famous hockey stick chart but of course, you know, I, I don't need to preach to the choir. I'm interested in something else. Uh, one of the less controversial principles of data visualization uh, is to focus on the data. So according to Ed Tufte, everything else is suspect of being chart chunk. Uh, and at best, this chart chunk is a distraction. And at worst, it's a lie. So considering this principle, the previous chart did not commit any major crimes. So of course, it's not the most pretty chart, but it shows the data, it provides sources and context, uh, 
And yet it's, it's really misleading uh, because we miss the relevant context. The problem is if you go uh, to the F FTP site to download the original data set, it doesn't give us a lot of context either. So we just get these two columns of uh, time and temperature. <clears throat> so the chart shows us a very convincing, appealing pattern. Uh, but of course, the data set doesn't really tell us uh, the whole story without the whole context of uh, paleoclimatology. Uh, so as we see, this principle is above all else, show the data is a little bit more complicated because we have to know actually, you know, where in the chart is the relevant information, what is data. Uh, to Tafti's credit, of course, he always emphasized the importance of context and understanding how, how data are generated. But <clears throat> I think this example is somewhat symptomatic of a particular issue in climate change discourse that what we know, we know basically from abstract models, but these models are somewhat disconnected from the world of sensory uh, phenomena, the, land, the, uh, the world of sensory perception. This is, of course, the way how science today works. Uh, but there are situations where we want to reconcile data with our sensory perceptions. Now, I would argue that the methods of data visualization as they are currently set up increases this decontextualization of data by focusing only on its internal structure ex rather than the external context. So this is a little bit how the way, it, this is a little bit how it works. We start with a data set. We, we can't do anything before we have a data set. Then we explore the data set, look, at, look for patterns in order to understand a phenomenon. But there's a gap between data and the phenomenon. Uh, we, we are basically locked into the, the symbolic space that is uh, defined by the data set. So now let's uh, move to autographic visualization. This is a picture of the data source of the previous data set. Uh, this is a picture of a Greenland ice core. It shows the annual layer structure. So it's, it's actually a, a visualization itself. It is a proxy data source. Uh, paleoclimatologists have quite a lot of those, you know, the, the tree ring networks uh, that uh, span uh, global scope. Uh, we have bioindicators. Uh, it's, it's all an active area of research. Uh, so this ice core image is a visualization in itself. Of course, not all relevant qualities and very few of the relevant qualities uh, to produce the temperature predictions are visual. But many of the qualities are made visual through the material treatment uh, of the sample, of, of the object. That starts with the way how scientists figured out in the 50s how to produce these ice cores in the first place uh, without <laughs> destroying everything. And uh, this is an, an image of the archive where ice cores are stored. Uh, this is the NSF facility in Denver, Colorado. So there are, of course, material implications uh, last year, university in Edmonton, Canada, has lost a third of their ice cores uh, during a power failure. But what I'm getting at is that data is a more universal concept. The data visualization universe is mostly uh, limited to symbolic data. By sy symbolic, I mean uh, encoded observations. Uh, this is, of course, a very narrow concept. Uh, archaeologists, for example, describe those pieces that they pull out from the ground as data. And, uh, you know, philosopher of uh, information, Luciano Floridi, uh, describes or defines a datum uh, in the broadest sense as a lack of uniformity. Or, or with uh, Gregory Bateson, from uh, anthropologist from the 70s, who, who famously said, a bit of information is the difference that makes a difference. So we are used to 
deal with symbolic data. All our uh, world, our mediated world, is surrounded, surrounds us with uh, symbolic data. And we treat them as abstract and transformable. But of course, the underlying concepts and the units still have, <coughs> sorry, still often have a sensory grounding. Uh, this is a, a nice example if you think of uh, the concept of color temperature, which very literally translates a visual phenomenon uh, into a, uh, a physical unit. <coughs> so to sum up, autographic visualization uh, is a set of techniques for revealing material phenomena and guiding the interpretation. Um, autographic means in this case that uh, the phenomenon reveals itself, it, it presents itself, and it it's inscribes itself. But this doesn't happen by itself. So we need uh, a set of, of design operations to, uh, yeah, to, for, for revealing material information. Interesting uh, example, like the Windsock, for example, where um, I didn't know originally that uh, the number of, of rings that you see actually translates to the wind speed in, in knots. Uh, so it's, it's quite sophisticated, although very simple. So if we make the same simple diagram for auto, autographic visualization, it would some, look something like that. We start with a phenomenon and look at the material conditions of data collection. Notice we are not going back to the 18th century of natural philosophy where everything is uh, set based on, in the senses. Uh, you know, we, we, we use data, but we want to understand how data are generated uh, in order to understand the analysis. Of course, uh, there's another gap here because we can do a lot of things with data that we cannot really do with material information. So, autographic visualization exists in a very rich cultural space, and over the years we, we collected a lot of example, uh, examples of uh, such practices. Uh, there's a Pinterest board uh, where you can browse some of these examples. So I'm talking about phenomena such as traces, uh, symptoms, specimen, and so on, um, which <coughs> are produced or analyzed or um, transformed in, in the sciences, let's say forensic sciences, archaeology, and so on, but also in ancient cultural techniques, such as hunting or agriculture, wayfinding, and these things. <clears throat> so traces as, as these kind of uh, autographic visualizations are a very interesting topic because they are, they are in between a lot of things. They, they resist being pinned down uh, with a very clear definition. Uh, so there are a couple of questions that, that come to mind. So one question is, how exactly is reading a trace different from reading a visualization or reading a visual sign? Uh, what makes a trace meaningful? Is the meaning something that is located in the object, in the material world, or is it in the interpretation? Uh, and most importantly for this discussion, are traces something that, uh, that are discovered, or is it something that is constructed in the act of reading? Uh, even if we take something simple such as tree rings, uh, we, we still have to cut down a tree in order to see them. So there are always uh, cultural techniques and specific ways of looking connected to those. So we, they're not purely discovered, but they're also not purely uh, constructed. Those questions are actually from a book that unfortunately is not available in English uh, by Sibylle Kramer and colleagues from uh, Humboldt University. And in German philosophy and, and media theory, there's a lot of work that deals with traces and their kind of epistemological implications. Unfortunately, uh, none of that is translated to English uh, as of now. Until, until recently, uh, Orkan and myself, we talked about these phenomena in the context of indexical visualization. Uh, Indexicality is a term that comes from classic semiology of uh, Charles Sanders Peirce, um, and this is how it works. <coughs> so we have, we have three types of signs. 
we have symbols, we have icons, and we have indices. Uh, so the, <coughs> the line in the middle is a symbolic, uh, is a symbolic sign that is defined by uh, a convention, cultural convention. Uh, the iconic sign works with similarity, and the indexical sign works through an existential connection between what we see and between what has happened. So there's a kind of causality implied. Um, <clears throat> and, and we chose this framework mostly to make a point that visual, data visualization and, and information design has a lot to do with symbolic representations and with iconic representations, but the indexical sign is completely absent. So what would a visualization language that focuses entirely on the indexical signs look like? Uh, over time, however, we found this semiotic framework both a little bit too limiting and both a little bit too broad. Uh, so the, for, for many reasons, we think that autographic, the autographic quality of traces is a little bit more accurate as a description. So now I want to briefly compare those two paradigms, data visualization and autographic visualization. In data visualization, we start with the data set. Uh, in autographic visualization, we look at the process of data generation and end with the data set. So this means that data visualization looks inwards at the internal structures uh, of a data set, whereas autographic visualization looks outwards at the context, at the implications, and at the origins of a data set. Uh, data visualization is representational, so you, you have a visual language that represents something else that is absent, uh, whereas in autographic visualization, uh, the trace presents itself, so it's non-representational. We, we, we don't have something absent that it, that it represents. Uh, and in terms of the design process, in data visualization, we encode data into visual variables. Whereas in autographic visualization, we isolate qualities of, of a phenomenon. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about related con uh, concepts in HCI. Uh, one of the most important one is uh, usually a popular uh, field of data physicalization, which I think is, is, is very important. Um, and, and also, you know, a lot of uh, my students and, and a lot of people produce amazing work in this space and uh, also psychologists are starting to explore what is the difference between uh, interacting with an object representation of, of a data set versus a, a visual representation. However, the big difference here is that data physicalization also starts with a data set. So uh, Yvonne Janssen et al. Uh, describe it as Physical visualizations map data to physical form. So, so we, we, we start with the data set. Uh, another recent approach was uh, termed qualitative displays by Dan Lockton and other colleagues from Carnegie Mellon. Uh, I see qualitative displays, this conceptualization, very closely related to um, ambient displays and uh, tangible media where, where the, the, one of the main ideas is not to kind of explicitly encode something into a number, but rather show a kind of ambiguous uh, image that represents certain qualities and, and provides a certain richness. So it, it, it connects a little bit to that. Um, yeah, indexical visualization, a number of people have uh, worked on that, including myself. And I think the one that is most closely associated with what we do is uh, the notion of self-illustrating phenomena. Uh, Pat Hanrahan uh, described it in a VIS talk in 2004, but there was never something published about it, uh, the, except the book in the, uh, hi on the history of uh, scientific image making. And he described self-illustrating phenomena as an image that is generated auto automatically as a result of an experiment. Uh, that exposes the phenomenon behind the observation. Uh, it presents, represents an answer to a question. So, so I think this is a very, there's a very direct connection here. Um, in, in this case, however, uh, self-illustrating phenomena were mostly limited to scientific image making. And there's, there's, a, there's a lot of uh, theory 
in media theory and, and history of science that deals with image making practices in the sciences. But many, and, and there, are, there are many more, uh, most of them agree that visualizations, data visualizations and physical phenomenon have a certain kinship. So there are, we, we read certain physical phenomena similar to how we would read a data visualization. So now we can talk, could talk a lot about what exactly constitutes this relationship. Is it, is it about metaphors or is it more about organizational principles that are so universal that even animals can, uh, can find them? But uh, I, I think there, there's, a lot, there's a lot of interesting space here to, to explore. But importantly, also historically, those two things were really treated in the same way. And I want to go back to uh, Etienne Jules Marais in his uh, groundbreaking book, uh, on, first published in 1878, on uh, the graphical method. I'm, I'm really surprised that this book doesn't exist in an English translation. And uh, Marais, in, in his book, he describes the graphical method, and he spends a lot of time talking about uh, statistical graphics and its uh, design principles. He has, of course, the famous uh, train schedule chart, which was later <laughs> reworked by Ed Tufty. But he quickly proceeds to other things, uh, things that followed him through the rest of his life, uh, where he described strange mechanisms for recording traces, such as recording uh, the pulse of a person. This was related to his own dissertation in the 1850s. Uh, or this is also a very interesting contraption where he tried to encode the movement uh, of a bird as it flies by connecting the bird with, with wires uh, to this machine. Uh, of course, he quickly moved to a, a little bit less cumbersome technique, uh, and he is mostly famous for his uh, chronophotography, high-speed photography with multiple exposures that he developed. And uh, he was so happy with this image of the flying gull that he also had it rebuilt in as a, as a wax model. Interestingly, not as small multiples, so to say, but as a single object of a of a bird that is compressed together. So he also uh, included data physicalization in his work. And importantly, he also created an early prototype of the wind tunnel. Uh, and I think the wind tunnel is the most beautiful and most uh, iconic example of a autographic display, which he called the smoke machine, where you would uh, be able to um, you know, look at turbulence through smoke traces. And just to give you an idea how the object looked like, uh, the smoke machine, so this is pure uh, cyber, uh, 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 steampunk um, with, with this uh, chamber. And in the spirit of Marais, uh, we also have a lot of cases where visualizations and traces are one and the same thing. If we think of the uh, seismometer or the seismograph that produces a line chart, which is at the same time a, a physical trace. So this now brings us into some kind of conceptual dilemma, because if, if uh, this line chart is at the same time a physical trace, what exactly is the difference to, let's say, a satellite image or a sensor that is connected to a computer that automatically records something on a hard disk or prints it on a screen. So those are, of course, also physical traces. So data visualizations are often literally physical traces. But that is a little bit absurd, because it would kind of uh, make it very confusing to talk about these things. And I can illustrate it with an example. You know, If we take GPS data, like here in a famous public data set of, of New York taxi cabs. We, we, we just have two numbers, you know, latitude and longitude. And if we print them all uh, in a two-dimensional space, unsurprisingly, we have a map of the city, 
But what is interesting, if you look at this kind of uh, blurry, blurry area, can anyone guess where this blur comes from, what that might be? And uh, what, what makes it blurry? Yeah. So exactly. So of course, we have tall buildings. And the tall buildings disrupt the, the GPS reflection, uh, reception. So in other words, we have a information about the third dimension of the city just based on this, this artifact of, of the um, GPS um, data collection. So I would argue that even data sets, we can read a data set in two different ways. You know, we can, we can uh, treat it purely symbolic and look at only patterns that are internal to the data set, or as in this case, we can look at the external context of the material data collection. So we, the, we, we don't know that this is actually because of tall buildings if we only look at the data set. We have to understand how GPS works, uh, all these kind of material uh, processes that happen. Uh, and if we take this material reading of a symbolic data set, we can get additional information such as the building height. Uh, versus in a classic data analysis paradigm, I would probably uh, you know, delete all the points that are in the ocean and delete all the points that are within the building just to kind of uh, remove the obvious mistakes rather than using the, those artifacts as a source of information. And I'll talk about that later a little bit more because there are many cases where digital information and, uh, plays a role in these kind of forensic techniques. So let's briefly talk about uh, autographic design operations. I will limit this only to the manipulation of indicators. You know, you have a phenomenon and you have an indicator that uh, illustrates this phenomenon and you can manipulate this indicator to, to make the phenomenon visible. Uh, two of the most basic design principles uh, of autographic visualization are framing and encoding. So if you consider this, it's called a cyanometer, it's this uh, 18th century device for measuring the blueness of the sky, for example, as a proxy for uh, humidity. So this device makes a lot of sense uh, in this conceptualization of the climate from the um, 18th and early 19th century, where climate was understood as a physical, as a sensory phenomenon rather than a statistical phenomenon. Uh, and what framing does is that framing transforms the way how we see something. Uh, so if we look at the sky through this uh, cyanometer, we see the phenomenon differently. And if we encode it into this kind of quantitative scale of blueness, uh, we again see it differently. And uh, this can easily be illustrated. You can try this out if you go to New York in uh, James Turrell's uh, installation meeting. And I, uh, I was surprised myself and I noticed other people there as well who just didn't recognize that this blue square at the ceiling is actually the sky. It's just a hole and you see the sky, but it, it looks in a way so artificial and so uh, decontextualized. And this is of course exactly what James Turrell wanted to do. He wanted to mess with our color perception. But this also shows us that framing really changes a phenomenon. And in art history and uh, photography, there's a lot of theory uh, around that, how that works. Uh, a second design principle is, is, is the one of constraining. So uh, if we think about the mercury in the mercury thermometer, mercury has a lot of properties, but we are only interested in the thermal expansion. So we have to constrain everything else and have only the thermal expansion as the only visible variation. And then again, we have here the principle of encoding with the scale. Um, it's, it's fascinating to read the letters that Daniel uh, Farnheit wrote uh, when he constructed his uh, thermometer uh, to realize how difficult and how complicated uh, such a banal uh, object uh, is if you design it from scratch. Uh, 
so it's it's we, we tend to kind of forget this and, and take all of these things for granted once it works. Um, constraining can also be very literal, uh, like in the case of the poor cannery in the coal mine, who would entertain the coal miner but also warn him uh, of imminent danger by by its own death. But sentinel species play a big role in the environmental sciences, uh, such as you know, mussels are a good uh, um, proxy for data quality, uh, for, for water quality. And sentinel species are often used because uh, they are both uh, faster, they can be cheaper uh, and more accurate than actual uh, digital sensors. So, so there, there's, there are a lot of practical reasons to use them, not just for uh, school science class demonstrations. Uh, is, is, uh, the next technique is aggregating and separating. So very often we deal with material phenomena, but we have to aggregate them to uh, see them, such as the dust mask, you know, where we suddenly see the air pollution that is otherwise invisible, uh, or separating in the case of uh, the ink uh, paper chromatography that uh, many, you know, played with in, in elementary school, uh, where the ink is separated in its components, uh, but that also is pretty much the same principle as in DNA electrophoresis uh, at work. Uh, one point about is that there are many different ways how uh, material is aggregated or separated, but uh, this also raises another interesting point, which is the role of time. So all autographic phenomena are about temporal phenomena. It's, it's all, uh, always about some kind of process of inscription that takes place over longer or shorter period of time. Uh, if we have a phenomenon that is invisible, but we want to make it visible, we can also couple it with a tracer substance. Uh, here the example with uh, Klabny's uh, figures, where he would visualize sound waves by adding the sand uh, on the vibrating object. And there are many, many different ways how to uh, how tracer substances visualize things by letting a phenomenon interact with, with something else. So now those were a couple of basic design principles. Now I want to look at how those things play together. Uh, in, for example, autographic environments, uh, again, the wind tunnel, a, a great example, where we have tracer substances, uh, we have a constrained environment, so we have, we have framing, we have all of these things. Um, this is a project by an artist, uh, Florian Dombois, who, who builds wind tunnels. Uh, and uh, Clemens Winkler, another artist who builds cloud chambers, and his uh, ultimate goal is to create a, a rectangular cloud how far he's along that route, but uh, it's, it's again, you're, you're building experimental uh, apparatuses that, you know, also in, in the history of science uh, played a very big role. So I want to talk about, also about digital physical systems. Uh, here I have to give credit uh, to my uh, old students in Austria who built this installation for Ars Electronica 2007 called Garden of Eden, where they visualized uh, air quality in different cities of the world uh, by uh, polluting salad plants um, driven by data. And uh, interestingly, I'm coming back to this project now because I've become interested in uh, practices of planting ozone gardens, which is, is another thing that uh, takes place in the US also, where certain plants are very sensitive to ozone and uh, you, you can really uh, observe them and, and register ozone uh, episodes. And last, of course, also you know, work with living materials uh, or uh, bacteria or smart materials where the, the idea is to design materials that have autographic qualities. There, there are also a lot of examples here. So ideally, we have a way where you know data visualization and autographic design can can work together. And uh, in my next 
part, I'm going to talk about some of these practices that already do that uh, in citizen science and, and other, other areas where both symbolic data and autographic design plays, plays together. And uh, of course, this is, this is very often done for rhetorical reasons to, to make a point. Uh, one of the first goals, most uh, prominent goals, is to make it possible to experience causality, because traces are always very connected to, causal, uh, to causality, or to use traces as signals of authenticity. So I'm going to start with an example uh, from citizen science, a uh, public lab uh, here in Cambridge, uh, very well known, uh, also uh, one of the co-directors, Sarah Wiley, uh, one of my colleagues at Northeastern. Um, she works on this project, Materializing Exposure, where uh, they use photo paper to measure the impact of fracking, the hydrogen sulfide that emanates from the ground, uh, taints the photo paper dark, so you can use it as a sensor. And they develop this into a citizen science technique. And when they do this, uh, interestingly, they create these maps that are at the same time symbolic representations, maps, but also uh, contain these physical traces. So this is not how you would do it in, let's say, you know, paradigm of cartographic communication theory. But I think it's no coincidence that those kind of practices especially emerge in citizen science, because citizen scientists are often outside the institutional space. So what the data sets that they produce are often subject to extra scrutiny because you know, anyone can make up numbers. Uh, and by showing the original trace, this is of course a rhetorical tactic of uh, demonstrating or, or under underlining causality. A second reason why we see this very often in, um, in, in citizen science is that uh, those groups work with communities on data collection. And to have this very visceral and tangible way of collecting data, this also is, is a tool for engagement. So it's, it's more fun and it's maybe more convincing to see what is actually happening what, what's, what actually happens if you see how the photo paper uh, darkens. So th those, are two, those are two ways. Uh, so how exactly does this work? Uh, you could describe it as annotated walkthroughs to um, guide the, the observer or the participant through the process of interpretation. So this is another example from a paper that I recently published on uh, amateur forensics in, in the Syrian war, where it was, was the first war where uh, a lot of, uh, where social media played a very central role for information warfare, also for reporting back to financial funders of different arms, armed groups uh, as, a, as a tool of communication. And then you had these online communities of, um, of, of conflict mappers who would scrutinize those horrible videos uh, on, on YouTube and in different um, social media channels and try to figure out what is really happening. And, and one example here is where one group would basically claim uh, to have captured a city, and they would post a video as a, as a proof. But then uh, those crisis mappers would come and uh, look at the position of buildings and uh, triangulate it with Google Earth or, or other tools, and then find out that actually this particular location uh, is at the outskirts of the city, not in the center. So it's refuting the claim that the city has been captured. Now, of course, they could just say that, but they are posting the original raw footage uh, from the web 
as a form of tableau to make this point. So uh, in order to, and they use this um, very simple annotation in, in a quite clever way to show you know, what, what are the same elements in those videos. So in other way, in, in other words, this is a, they are walking the viewer through the, to, to make the work of the cartographer themselves. So this is, you, has been sometimes described as non-representational cartography because it's not a simple act of representation where you just present someone with the result, but you basically uh, make them work and make uh, them connect the dots in order to, f to figure out uh, the conclusion. Uh, last point which we, I want to connect back to uh, data collection methods uh, that I call sensory accountability uh, as a form of accountability of data collection methods and metrics and thresholds. And this is from a recent art project I did in Germany earlier this year in Stuttgart. And Stuttgart is a city that has a notorious uh, relationship with air pollution. It's a, it's a kind of very polluted city, although pollution is always a relative term in the, in the global scale, but well, it's a big political issue nevertheless. And uh, you have citizen scientists who built an impressive network of uh, dust sensors and you have the city who disputes the claim and very often those political controversies revolve around what is an appropriate threshold of uh, exposure, uh, what, you know, how do we, how should we think about that? And, and all of those metrics are actually not ideal, you know, the uh, particulate matter, uh, the gravimetric <coughs> unit that is used is, doesn't really capture all those dimensions of, of air pollution. Um, but so my approach was to make the actual material of air pollution visible. Uh, so this is, for example, a test strip from a gravimetric analysis where you have this uh, filter in a sensor. Usual di digital sensors work with a, a light barrier where they just register uh, if a particle, uh, you know, ob obstructs the view. And, and basically use that as a proxy, but the accurate lab method is to collect the actual um, um, matter and weight it. So and this is how it looks like. And I thought that, okay, so this matter not only accumulates on these test strips, but basically everywhere in the city, on every facade, on every surface. Uh, so basically the whole city is a visualization of, uh, of, of air pollution. We just cannot see it, but we, we lack the framing, we lack the tool to make a visual comparison. And so I use this technique uh, called reverse graffiti, which works like this. So you basically just use a stencil and a pressure washer to uh, clean surfaces and create patterns. This is very often used by activists because legally it's not graffiti, so they are not adding any paint and so they are not <laughs> destroying anything. They're just cleaning something. And uh, of course, cities don't really accept this claim very easily. And uh, so we had to go through a very rigorous process of getting the permissions to do that even though nothing much really happened. But uh, so we created all over the city these uh, reverse graffitis. And the way how this is designed, of course, this is a visual reverence, reference to these gravimetric strips. But you also see this half-toning pattern. And they will disappear over time. So after six months, they're mostly gone. And uh, first one is probably you know this very subtle one that will disappear first. And so you get a sense of how these things will slowly disappear uh, in order to you know, observe the process of uh, air pollution. Of course, you know, this is not just particulate matter what is on these surfaces, uh, so that's an obvious problem for a scientific way of measurement. But of course, the official ways of measuring air pollution are also not perfect. So it's a little bit about this mutual uh, imperfect methods of capturing a phenomenon that is now often described as the exposome that is, has, is a qualitative, very complex phenomenon. 
And uh, I also wanted to connect it back to the digital data. Uh, we used a sensor and uh, you know, put in the microgram uh, average uh, exposure over the past month and uh, built a website where you can uh, watch the real-time result of the sensor network and uh, look at the photos uh, of these of these different dust marks in the city. So I'm I'm interested in juxtaposing the material phenomenon with uh, with the digital data, and in, in order to basically ground this discussion more in in the material dimension. So to to finish up, of course, uh, you know we have to be careful uh, when we deal with physical traces. And uh, we, we shouldn't really take physical traces, uh, equate them with evidence. And uh, there are good reasons. Uh, this, you know, there are a lot of examples of evidence that are not really uh, convincing and not really, they, are, they might be convincing, but uh, they don't uh, represent causality. And uh, you know we have uh, a lot of material evidence of uh, UFO sightings or, or other things uh, of footprints of humans next to footprints of dinosaurs and things like that. So uh, if we go back into this mode of you know fetishizing material evidence and traces, this this would be a kind of a shortcut of of you know looking at a naive empiricist position. Uh, but so ultimately, when we experience causality, we are actually speculating. It's, it's a mode of speculation. Um, and historically, traces, even if there is a clear causal connection, have often been overinterpreted and, you know, uh, added with ideological beliefs and positions. And the history of the fingerprints and forensic identification is a good example of that. Uh, Francis Galton, originally he was really interested in fingerprints. I mean, it, it was for a long time, it was clear that fingerprints somehow identify a human and that they are somehow unique. This, this was not exactly a new idea. But Francis Galton, as a eugenicist, he was interested in learning about um, you know, behavioral uh, qualities from analyzing fingerprints, whether someone will become a criminal or not, or uh, also tried at least to distinguish or to uh, derive the, the race uh, from a fingerprint. But of course, you know, the trace presents itself. It doesn't really tell a story, so uh, we can project a lot of things into traces. And uh, fingerprints have resisted being uh, you know, like correlated with race or, or anything else. And of course, you know, all, all other forensic modes of identification, which at some point were legitimate, considered legitimate science, not chunk science or fringe science, such as uh, Bigfoot or UFOs, uh, you know, f fall into this trap. So this is not the, the point I want to make. I'm, I'm really, on the one hand, more interested in this process of data generation and making it uh, more accountable. But on the other hand, I think there's, a, there's an important point that we oft, often overlook in data visualization, where um, we, we, we basically treat the visualization as a stable artifact. And whether you understand it or not, it's just a question of visual literacy. And if you don't understand it, there's a way to learn it. Uh, in autographic visualization, it doesn't really work like that. So everyone sees traces slightly differently. A musician hears auditory phenomena different from an untrained uh, person. Architect sees buildings differently. And, and I'm arguing this is not just a difference in interpretation, but the actual perception, uh, the phenomenon presents itself differently. And, uh, if we use this, if we take this seriously in a mode of autographic visualization, we have to, to put the uh, 
the observer which now becomes a participant into the center. So we, we cannot basically remove the, uh, the participant from the process of, uh, of visualization. And the participant cannot just learn how to read it, uh, they have to tune into this phenomenon to, to really become sensitive. Like, uh, and there are fascinating ethnographies of hunter-gatherers that, of course, you know, they have amazing skills of really reading the tiniest things into a spore, into an animal footprint. But then often they also make mistakes, so they kind of go back and, and figure out uh, certain things. And uh, so it, it is, it is an epistemic process of, uh, of knowledge generation, and and what I like about it is that um, it it turns the process of visualizing something into kind of an experiment, uh, where the outcome is not always completely clear. And yeah, this is this is basically where I want to leave it today and uh, open up for questions. Uh, I have a couple of references, you know, if you're interested in in reading the papers or, or looking at stuff here. We also did a data stories uh, on the subject, which was a lot of fun. And yeah, thank you again. All right, so we've got some time for questions. We have microphones, so uh, raise your hand and we'll bring you a mic. It was a great talk. Thank you so much. Um, you talked about autographic uh, visualizations uh, not being, like the, the result of it not being apparent when you start. How do you, how do you prototype or test before you actually go full full scale? Well, with the <clears throat> with the reverse graffiti, I was very nervous because I really didn't know whether it will work or not. And uh, so it was, it was actually an experiment for me. Uh, and I learned a lot in the process that you know, cert it doesn't really work on certain surfaces. Uh, untreated concrete surfaces are the best. They create an amazing contrast. So uh, you know, those are not kind of you know, scientific questions, but it's, 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 a, it's a practice. It's, it's a way of figuring out how to do certain things. Uh, that that always have to be part of it. You, well, how to prototype it? Yeah, that's that's of course a little bit harder than, than in data visualization, where uh, the mode of evaluation is maybe a little bit more streamlinable. Um, so yeah. <laughs> uh, we have another question back here. Hello. My question is that if we are to start from the phenomena and then go to the data, but if we are like trying to figure out the phenomena by going into the data first, right? So like how to do mm -hmm. the iterations, mm -hmm. because mostly what I do is like, I try to figure out the phenomena by going into the data. So how to start with one? Mm -hmm. No, I mean, it's, 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 it's definitely true that basically just, you know, going into patterns, uh, or looking for patterns, mm -hmm. which then make you curious about exactly what's going on here. You find a pattern, you, you take it as a signal for something that, that you don't understand yet. And so this is this kind of back and forth, which is also the same as this process of tuning that I'm, that I'm talking about. So, you know, I don't, I don't really see it as a, uh, you know, as something that is completely different, but, but I think just, if you, if someone gives you a data set, uh, you are you are pretty much limited by how far you can get with this approach. If if you don't have a lot of a lot of context, and in the public discourse, uh, those things matter. I mean, people can find all kinds of patterns in in all kinds of data sets and present them as evidence, and then it becomes really hard to basically go back and forth and and to basically ground this again in, in the material reality. I mean, this is, this is what, what I think would make sense if you ground it also in your physical environment. Wondering, um, 
in terms of making data more perceptible, uh, how is, is there a way you would approach uh, the data that's generated from online websites and clickstream data and just the massive amounts of data we have on the web? Because it's a result of a you know, real phenomenon, but how do you make that perceptible? It's not like an environmental, physical phenomenon. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. It's a social phenomenon that, of course, is also material in a certain sense. Uh, but of course, I mean, we are surrounded by symbolic data, and it's part of our world. Uh, it's an increasingly uh, significant part of our world. And uh, yeah, I mean, for these kind of things, uh, I had a couple of example where, examples where indexical principles could be translated to uh, data that come from a purely digital source. So uh, there's one example by, I forgot, uh, a British information designer who visualized the casualties of the Iraq war uh, as a data visualization. And what he did is he picked exactly one pixel for every person who died. And uh, that, of course, creates, a, again, a kind of an indexical relationship because now you're no longer variable in scale. You cannot scale it up because one pixel really has a specific meaning. And that would be a translation to kind of, uh, you know, bring back this kind of existential relationship between the data set and its representation into a digital space. So what would you do with the climate change data? <laughs> so uh, good that you ask. Uh, <laughs> we have an exhibition coming up uh, with uh, uh, our friend Ben. Uh, and uh, maybe too early to talk about it. But uh, there are, um, I think, many related phenomena. You know, it's, it's not just uh, the average global temperature is not the only way to think about climate change. If you foreground all the different proxy data sources, uh, if you look at uh, you know, bioindicators, behavior of insects, and all those things are also following a very uh, pragmatic way if you look at, look at them as data sources. For example, uh, looking at certain insects that inhabit uh, tree barks, uh, it's those, it's those insects are not necessarily selected because they are very best indicators, because, but because uh, the forestry industry collects a lot of, lot of data about these insects. So uh, there, there are a lot of, diff so um, proxy data sources are always also an opportunistic data source, <laughs> but they also highlight a lot of implications. So the fact that those data sources are collected already tells us something about the implication uh, on the real world. And, and I think, uh, you know, things with, uh, you know, even ozone impact is related to climate change because, uh, you know, it originates from the same source and the increasing temperatures also um, make ozone uh, more likely to, uh, you know, be generated. So, the, the set of relationships is, is very dense, and there are a lot of things that, that you can start from. So I guess kind of follow up to that. Um, how do you control for biases in proxy data sources without going crazy? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think the example that I showed in the beginning is, 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 is one of these uh, indicates that because um, the falling temperatures are, are actually patterns in the data, but it's just local. It's, it's just a local effect uh, in Greenland. And uh, I think the autographic visualization can never do those things that data analysis excels at. You know, from, a, from this kind of statistical big data approach, we can control for biases. We cannot really do that very well in a kind of physical experimental setup. What we can do is show uh, 
or, or kind of understand the process. It's more about understanding the process itself. But, but I think it's, it's, not a, it's not an alternative for, for working with data. What do you think of data science as a profession? <laughs> um, how do you mean this question? <laughs> Um, I, I mean it in the, <laughs> in the sense of uh, uh, in the continuum between somebody who's simply coding in the mm -hmm. sense of programming and somebody who's practicing in mm -hmm. the sense of the architect or, or mm -hmm. the doctor. Uh, in between those, we now have this very large growing yeah. cadre of data Good scientists. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, no, I mean, I think uh, when, when I, uh, during my PhD, I, uh, learned statistics in a very traditional way, you know, how you have a controlled experiment and then you analyze uh, the example and build models from it. And of course, uh, how data sets, the availability of data sets have, uh, have of course changed all of that because those data sets, okay, we have much more data, but those data sets are also opportunistic data sets. They are, contain all kinds of biases. So the focus of the profession has shifted. Uh, I mean, this is of course uh, ob ob obvious stuff, but, but I, I, I would say that uh, good data science also requires the acknowledgement of these material processes, as in the example of the GPS uh, data, where you have to understand the physical processes that generated the data set or the social process that generated the data set, knowing that, you know, this is also speculation to some extent, but uh, yeah, I, I think there are a lot of interesting uh, points of connection that traditional statistics did not really uh, acknowledge. Listening to what you're saying, uh, it's interesting to uh, realize that thanks to technology, we're basically blurring the, the divi divide between culture and uh, nature, for the mm -hmm. lack of a better word. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that when we're doing this in terms of the indexical aspects or mm -hmm. uh, uh, the way uh, natural phenomena display themselves, or we let them display themselves. Mm -hmm. Isn't there also uh, an interesting direction towards culture, where a lot, of, a lot of recording and representation of phenomena has been done since the cave paintings? And uh, exploring that landscape the same way we're interested into the so-called unknown, yeah is quite interesting because I believe there is language that has been used that might be interesting in terms of describing or things that have been described in a certain way that we forgot or yeah. they are no longer part of our cultural discourse, uh, yeah. current culture discourse. I absolutely agree and, and I think like a lot of, lot of cultural practices deal with uh, producing traces and analyzing them uh, but it's, it's often kind of disconnected. It uh, is not seen through a common lens and very often it's not even seen as a visual practice. When you read a paper uh, or when you look at appendix of a book about the methods of data collection, it's, it's a very bi bureaucratic representation usually where, okay, you know, uh, those we, we did these kind of things. But uh, if you actually uh, looking at the processes, they're actually visual processes very often or, or sensory processes. And uh, I, th I think what I'm interested in is by connecting a lot of these ancient and modern uh, practices uh, by looking at them as visual practices that share many similarities in, in all of these uh, areas. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I was struck, Dietmar, by the by the way you you framed it right at the beginning. This relationship between the data and the phenomenon and analysis and. Uh, what I've what I've found in many of the examples from like late 18th or early 19th century uh, visualizations mm -hmm. and the, the trace 
the trace example that comes to mind was there was a machine that was built in the late 1700s for, or even before that, for recording wind speed yeah. that actually drew, it, it, drew, it drove a pencil that, <coughs> that would draw something on a drum that was rotating, right? And they recognized this as an interesting phenomenon, but it was useless if it wasn't turned into numbers. Yeah. That people didn't, initially, people didn't recognize the value of the visual trace unless they could turn it into numbers in the mm -hmm. same way that many of Playfair's early work wasn't trusted because people just wanted to see the numbers. The pictures were nice, but if it was valuable information, it had to be quantified. So this ability to read the landscape or to re read the phenomenon that you're describing is, uh, as, w as we've all said, has a long history. It's, it's interesting to bring it back. Marie also talks about that in his book as of the uh, statistics, okay, this is kind of uh, the kind of the simple stuff, but science, you know, that's the <laughs> more important thing. Uh, I, and uh, historians of science and uh, uh, philosophers often talk about this shift from a, a sensory rooted concept of science to a, to a number, a computation centric one and some, somehow locating this somewhere between 18, mid 18th century and mid 19th century. It's, it's, a, it's a shift from experimentalism to more uh, theoretical driven approaches. And uh, I mean, of course, there were good reasons uh, for that. Uh, and and I th but I think there are also reasons now, I mean, now we take the computational grounded uh, paradigm totally for granted. I mean, this is just a natural way how we engage with our environment. Uh, so I think it's a good uh, it's a it's a good idea to also look at the kind of physical implications of these things. And and so in a way, I don't really want to go back, <laughs> but uh, I, I I think it's an interesting way to. And and I see a lot of people now. I mean, since you know we we started working on that like about 10 years ago, and it was so considered so esoteric that nobody would be interested in it. But now I see a lot of people are interested in kind of material phenomena as information, as data. And uh, of course, you know, in the, in the current theoretical discourse, I mean, it's all about materiality or almost too much <laughs> at this point. But uh, it, it, is, it is definitely, a, there's a certain uh, perception that this is, uh, this is something that's becoming more important again, I think. All right, any, any last questions? All right. Well, I'd like to thank Dietmar for the wonderfully engaging talk. Thank you very much. And I have a favor to ask. Would you like to help me draw the raffle winners for this evening? <laughs> So we're, we're doing three tickets. So if you have your red, uh, red raffle ticket. All right. All right. First one is 329748. All right. Congratulations. Three two nine seven four eight. You've won a uh, Boston Kai Bluetooth speaker. Thank you. Congratulations. All right. Three two nine seven zero one. All right. Peter, talk to Dan. You've won a ticket for oh, you're drawing the hat <laughs> for Boston IA Day. And now for the second Boston IA Day, we have. Three two nine seven zero five. All right, please uh, go talk to Dan. Congratulations, everyone. Thank you again, Dietmar, and thank, thank you, you, Google, and Bentley, and Huawei. And please um, take any uh, recycling or trash with you as you exit the room and join us for dessert and drinks outside. Thank you very much. <laughs>